God wants you to be happy. I don't think that's the view many people have of God. They think that he is just the ultimate party crasher. He's out to reign in your parade. He's out to make your life miserable. Nothing could be further from the truth. Let's grab our Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter five. Matthew chapter five, and the title of my message is How to Be Happy. When you get down to it, pretty much everyone, deep down inside, wants to be happy. It's even in our Declaration of Independence where we speak of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So here's the question, are we happy? According to a recent study, Americans are less happy than they were 30 years ago. Well, maybe we should start by trying to define happiness. What exactly is happiness? Over the years, many have opined on the topic. Charles M. Schultz, the creator of Peanuts, summed it up this way. Happiness is a warm puppy. Okay, that's one definition. Albert Schweitzer said, happiness is nothing more than good health and a bad memory. Um, George Burns, comedian, said, quote, happiness is having a large, loving, caring family in another city. Okay, <laughs> Oscar Wilde said, quote, some cause happiness wherever they go. Others cause happiness whenever they go. Uh, Dave Chappelle, the comedian, said the higher up I go for some reason, the less happy I am. You've heard of Shakira. She's experienced global success and fame of happiness. She said, quote, it's reserved for a very select number of people and I can't say I'm part of that club at the moment, end quote. So what is happiness exactly? Why can't Shakira find happiness? Why does Dave Chappelle say the higher up he goes, the less happy he is? Well, let's start by saying where you won't find happiness. You will not find happiness by pursuing it in and of itself. You won't find happiness in any object. You won't find happiness in anything this world or this culture has to offer. It's been said, quote, there are two sources of unhappiness in life. One is not getting what you want, and the other is getting it. You know, you've heard the expression, careful what you wish for. And many have all of their dreams realized, and they have all the things that this world promises will bring happiness, and they find that is not the case. Money can buy you some things, but it cannot buy you the most important things. Money can buy you a bed but it cannot buy you a good night's sleep. Money can buy you books, but it can't buy you brains. It can buy you a house, but it can't buy you a home. Money can buy medicine, but not health. Money can buy amusement, but it can't buy happiness. C.S. Lewis summed it up this way, and I quote, God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel for our spirits that they were designed to burn or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other way. This is why, says Lewis, it's just no good asking God to make us happy in our own way without bothering about faith. God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it's not there. There is no such thing, end quote. And that's so true. One of the foremost experts on happiness made this candid admission, and I quote, I don't have a religious or a spiritual bone in my body, yet I have to acknowledge that studies reveal that people with faith in God are the happiest, end quote. So it really comes down to this. Happiness does not come from what you have, it comes from who you know. And the Bible emphatically says, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Why is the Christian faith a happy faith? The Christian faith is a happy faith because it's a 
hopeful faith because we have hope in this life and we have hope in a better life to come. And here's something that might surprise some people. God wants you to be happy. I don't think that's the view many people have of God. They think that he is just the ultimate party crasher. He's out to reign in your parade. He's out to make your life miserable. Nothing could be further from the truth. The fact is God wants you to be happy. Now, when I say that God wants you to be happy, that doesn't mean that you walk around with a phony smile permanently plastered on your faith, a face rather. Uh, so like when you're going to the dentist to get a root canal, you're smiling. <laughs> you're waiting in line at the DMV for the third hour, you're smiling. <laughs> Wherever you go, you're smiling. You're gonna look mentally ill, not happy. As a Christian, we will have times of sorrow. The Bible even says there's a time to laugh and there's a time to cry. As Christians, we will still face tragedy, but what the Bible is saying, overall, you can have happiness. But we have to come to this. God's definition is probably different than our definition of happiness, and it's laid out before us here in the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. This is effectively the worldview of Jesus Christ. And it's important to know that everybody has a worldview. The question is, do you have a biblical worldview? What does that mean? That means as I, be, as I become familiar with the Bible, as I read the Bible, as I memorize the Bible, as I internalize the truths of Scripture, my thinking begins to change. And I start thinking biblically and I see things through a biblical lens, hence I have a biblical worldview. So if you wanna know what the worldview of Jesus is, read the Sermon on the Mount. We cover so many topics in it. Jesus talks about what happiness is. Jesus talks about the purpose of marriage. Jesus talks about prayer. Jesus talks about worry. Jesus talks about what foundation your life is built on and so much more. You wanna know what Jesus thinks? Read this sermon. And by the way, you can read the entire Sermon on the Mount in one sitting. You want to know how his heart really beats? Study this sermon. You want to know how he feels about living and life in general? Read this sermon. By the way, the Sermon on the Mount is the longest recorded message that Jesus ever gave. It's also one of the most beautiful and best known portions of Scripture. There's a lot of phrases that have entered our vernacular that are popular in culture today that all come from the Sermon on the Mount, like turn the other cheek, that's from the Sermon. Go the extra mile, that's also from the Sermon on the Mount. The Golden Rule, all from this Sermon. Now the Sermon on the Mount begins with what we often call the Beatitudes. Uh, they've been described as the beautiful attitudes or attitudes that should be. Another way you could sum them up is the be happy attitudes. Now, the first four beatitudes deal with our relationship with God. The second four deal with our relationships with others. And we're gonna focus on the first four in this message. And I want you to remember that the word blessed, each beatitude begins with the word blessed. The word blessed is interchangeable with the word happy, all right? so. Basically, Jesus is saying, if you want to be happy, be these things and do these things. All right, so let's read them together. We're going to read Matthew chapter 5, verse 2, down to verse 9. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, that would be the disciples, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So there are the first Beatitudes 
And it's interesting that the word blessing is used again and again. You know, people use these words, even people who are not believers, they'll talk about blessings. Well, only the believer can genuinely experience blessing. I think sometimes we use the word bless to get rid of someone. Someone's talking too long, we say, great seeing you, God bless you. This says, go away now, right? But uh, here's point number one. God wants you to be blessed and happy. God wants you to be blessed and happy. Jesus both began and concluded his earthly ministry blessing people. When he met those two downhearted disciples on the Emmaus Road after he was crucified, we read that he blessed them. When children came to him, he took them into his arms and he blessed them. After his resurrection, we read that he lifted his hands and he blessed them. So God wants to bless you. We see this from Genesis to Revelation. To Revelation. There was a blessing that the priests were to pronounce over the people of Israel. And they would say, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God wants to bless you. Let me take it a step further. God loves to bless you. Sometimes we think God is stingy. He's holding back his blessings. Do you know a stingy person? No, you can't have that. Do you know a generous person? Yes, you can have that and even more. God is generous, not stingy. Bringing me to point number two, happy people are humble people. Happy people are humble people. Now, this has been wrongly understood to be saying blessed are the poor. This is not what Jesus said. He said blessed are the poor in spirit. There is no blessedness in being rich or poor in and of itself. The Bible does not commend poverty, nor does it condemn wealth. It does say the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, people sometimes say, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. I don't know what Bible you're reading, but my Bible doesn't say that. My Bible says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which while some have coveted after they've erred from the faith. Money's neutral. Money can be good. Money can help. Money can do things for the kingdom of God. Money can be problematic. It can even be evil. It can destroy a person's life. It all depends on your attitude toward it. What Jesus says is blessed are the poor in spirit. What does this mean? Blessed is the man, blessed is the woman, happy is the person who sees himself as they really are, lost, hopeless, and destitute and desperately in need of God. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. So you have to see yourself for who you are. You have to see yourself as a sinner who really needs a savior. And uh, this is hard for some people to call themselves what they are, to see themselves as they are. I mean, this is counter to culture today. We're told things like, you're more than enough. Uh, Self-love is the greatest love. You're a winner at our, at our games for our children. Uh, you know, we don't keep score because everyone's a winner. Everyone is not a winner. There are losers in life. We're not all that in a bag of chips, as some think. Uh, Self-love is not the greatest love. You are not more than enough. You need help. You're a sinner, as I am, as we all are. You know, if you want to be a happy person, it's going to require that you stop doing some things and start doing other things. Psalm 1 tells us about the happy man or the blessed man. It says, he doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful. That's what he doesn't do. But what he does do is he meditates in the word of God day and night. And here's the promise. If you do this, You'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You'll bring forth fruit in your season. Whatever you do will prosper. Stop some things, start other things. As one person put it, an old preacher from the 1700s, it's the expulsive power of a new affection. The expulsive power of a new affection. When you love Jesus with all of your heart, you will in turn not want to do those things that will keep you from him. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that see themselves as they really are. Oh, we can spend a life chasing after happiness and never finding it. We say, I need to find myself. I'm leaving this marriage. I'm not happy anymore. I need to find myself. Oh, shut up. You want to find yourself? Jesus says lose yourself. Deny yourself. The Bible is counter to all the things the culture tells us. Uh, Jesus says humble yourself, lose yourself, and you'll find yourself. The Bible tells us humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he'll exalt you in due time. If you want to try, if you want to find true happiness, you must be poor in spirit. See yourself as you really are. Classic example of a guy who was poor in spirit is a man who went into the temple to pray. Jesus told the story. Two men went in the temple to pray. One was a sinner, one was a Pharisee. Actually, the sinner was a publican. Not a Republican, a publican. <laughs> and that meant he was a tax collector. So they were not looked upon favorably at that time. They're not looked on favorably in this time. but. They both went to pray, a sinner and a Pharisee who was of the highest order of religious accomplishment. And so the Pharisee starts his prayer like this, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Man, you know your prayers are messed up when you say something like that. And then he takes it a step further, especially not like this dude over here. And then Jesus said, and the sinner wouldn't even lift his eyes up. He just beat his chest and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And then he even said, actually in the original language, it would be, God be merciful to me, the sinner. He said, man, I, I'm, I'm the worst of the lot. God be merciful. That's all he said. Jesus said, who do you think went down justified? It wasn't that Pharisee. It was a man who saw his real condition. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Beatitude number two, point number three. Happy people are, I'll put in quotes, unhappy people. Happy people are unhappy people. Point number one, happy people are humble people. Number two, happy people are unhappy people. Verse four, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. You could also translate this, happy are the unhappy. What? what? That doesn't make any sense to us. So to be happy, I need to be sad, yes. In this way, you have to see yourself as you really are. I'm a sinner who needs a savior and I'm sorry for what I've done and I wanna change so I mourn over my condition. Listen, better to mourn now and laugh later than to laugh now and mourn later. Some people, all they wanna do is laugh. All they want to do is get drunk and party and laugh and laugh and laugh. They don't even know what they're laughing at. Everything's funny to a drunk. But really, what is that all about? Solomon went on a sin binge, basically trying everything the world has to offer. And he said in Ecclesiastes 2, when I said, come on, let's give pleasure a try. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found it was meaningless. Solomon says, it's silly to be laughing all the time. What good does it do to only seek pleasure? You know, some people, they suppress tears. They should be crying, and instead, they're laughing. Before he died of AIDS, Freddie Mercury, the lead singer of Queen, recorded a song called Party. And in the song he sings, quote, we were up all night singing and giving a chase. The next morning, everybody was hung over. And then in the refrain, he repeatedly implores his party mates to come back and play, end quote. But see, here's the problem. There comes a time when the party's over. All the laughing is behind you and it really has led to nothing. It's better to be sad over your condition because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow which lacks repentance results in spiritual death. In other words, hey, I'm sorry, and I'm sorry enough to stop. See, the, the problem is we will minimize sin. We'll say things like, well, God loves me and accepts me as I am. Hey, man, don't judge my journey. Right? 
Well, God does love you, and he does accept you as you are. But he wants to change you. And he wants you to repent of your sin. And he wants you to come into a right relationship with, you, with him. When the prodigal son was away from his father, he was sad. When he returned to his father in repentance, he was glad. That brings us to point number four. A happy person will be a meek person. A happy person will be a meek person. Blessed are the meek. Now, meekness is not celebrated in our culture, maybe because we don't understand what it is. Uh, for starters, meekness is not weakness. The best definition of meekness is power under constraint. It's interesting because it, it describes the breaking of a powerful stallion. So when you climb on a beautiful horse, how many of you love to ride horses? You know, we have a few equestrians out there. I prefer horsepower. Uh, I like a throttle. And I decide when it starts and when it stops. Because I was on a horse once that wouldn't stop. And uh, that's kind of a scary process. Like where's the emergency brake on this animal, right? So the idea is that you're breaking the horse, as they say. The horse is submitting its will. It's not that it's lost its will. It's not that it's not stronger than you, but it has surrendered its will to the rider. So when the Bible talks of weakness, it doesn't mean I, or meekness, it doesn't mean I'm weak. It means I know who's in charge. And I've surrendered my will over to his. But in our culture, we celebrate revenge. You know, there are these films out with Liam Neeson called Taken, right? Taken, there's three Taken films. What if they came out with a fourth film in the Taken series, but it was different. Taken, turning over a new leaf. And in the film, Liam Neeson picks up the phone and he says, I have a particular set of skills. <laughs> skills that make me a nightmare for a person like you. I will pursue you, I will find you, and I will forgive you. <laughs> Who would watch that? That sounds good. I will forgive you and give you a quick hug. Wait, no, no you kill them. But before you kill them, you beat them mercilessly. And that's the movie I wanna see, in slow-mo, preferably. But, but this is what the Bible is saying, it's forgiving. It, one of the best examples of meekness and forgiveness in the Bible is the story of Joseph sold by his brothers into slavery, ultimately exalted to a powerful position where he could have had them all summarily executed, but instead he forgives them. That is what meekness is. But the ultimate example of meekness is Jesus himself. He laid down everything for us and willingly went to the cross and died in our place. And the only autobiographical statement ever Jesus gave, he said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, I am meek and lowly in heart. Does that mean Jesus was weak? Of course not. He was the strongest man who ever lived. With just a word, he could destroy his enemies. When they arrested him in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am. And the Bible says they all fell backwards. It's like dominoes, I am. Those are the words of God from Mount Sinai to Moses. I am that I am. Jesus could have said, I am. And you were, by the end. Do that in slow motion. But he did not act in that way. He laid his life down for us. Number four, a happy person passionately desires a righteous life. Excuse me, that's number five. A happy person passionately desires a righteous life. Verse six, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now this is talking about a spiritual hunger, so let's put it all together. First I see myself as I really am, poor in spirit, spiritually destitute a sinner in need of a savior. I'm sorry for my condition. I mourn over my condition. I repent over my condition. And then a true meekness enters into my life, a humility as I've seen myself as I really am because I've seen God for who he is. And now I have a new hunger and thirst for righteousness. 
Let's summarize and close. You must be poor in spirit. Number one, see yourself as you really are. You must mourn for your sin. Number three, you must have a change in attitude and have a hunger and thirst for God who will satisfy you. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. It's hard to be happy when your conscience is racked with guilt. Because the Bible also says, happy is the person whose sin is forgiven. When your sin is forgiven, it changes everything. Maybe I'm talking to somebody right now who is racked with guilt because of something you've said, something you've done. You're saying, how do I get rid of this guilt? Well, get to the source of it. What is the source of your guilt? The source of your guilt is sin. So if your sin is forgiven, your guilt is removed. Guilt has its place. I know sometimes people say guilt is bad. Well, guilt can be bad if it's a wrong kind of guilt, but guilt can also be an indication that your conscience is working. And you say, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. And I have guilt. But when your sin is forgiven, now the guilt will be removed. And the way that can happen is when you just come to God and take step one of the Beatitudes. Blessed is the poor in spirit. Lord, I see myself as I am. Forgive me of all of my sin. Hi, I'm Greg Laurie. I've got some good news for you. God loves you, and God has a plan for your life. Here's the problem. We're separated from God by our sin because we've all broken His commandments. But the good news is, is 2,000 years ago, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sin and then to rise again from the dead. The same Jesus who died and rose is alive and ready to come into your life right now. Would you like your sin forgiven? Would you like to know that when you die, you will go to heaven? If so, pray this simple prayer with me right now. Just say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin. I turn from my sin now, and I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Did you just pray that prayer with me? If you did, God in heaven has heard you. Congratulations and welcome to the family of God.